अच्छा आसपास ही होगा सर हाँ हाँ सर वो बाजू में ही है बाजू में ही है मैं वहां पहुंचते पहुंचते रह गया सर इसलिए बीपीएससी में इंटरव्यू दिया था अच्छा 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 लेकिन हुआ ही नहीं सर किस किस सब्जेक्ट में सब्जेक्ट हिस्ट्री से दिया था सर मुझे इंटरव्यू में तीन नंबर दे दिए थे अच्छा कोई होगा कोई दूसरा कैंडिडेट होगा कुछ धनदेवी जी हंस रहे हैं वॉक करते करते धनदेवी मैम खूब वॉक करते हैं पूरा पूरा डेढ़ घंटा हम देखते हैं इसका मतलब आप नोटिस करते हैं धनदेवी जी पूरा पूरा वहाँ का जो नेचुरल इन्वायरमेंट है वो सब दिखाते हैं आप चाहती हैं कि नोटिस किया जाए यूनिवर्सिटी के बिल्कुल पास में रहती हूँ हेलो आवाज ही गायब हो गई लेकिन सर की मैं कह रहा हूँ नहीं नहीं मेरी आवाज गायब हो गई सर मैं ये बोल रही हूँ मैं यूनिवर्सिटी के पास ही रहती हूँ और वही ग्रीनरी का सीन आप लोगों को चार से दिखाती रहती हूँ बहुत बढ़िया कभी कभी कुछ खिला भी दिया कीजिए वहीं से सर आप आइए बहुत बेलकम अलीगढ़ आप आइए और मैम बीच बीच में खुद को म्यूट करके बोल रही हैं नहीं नहीं वो ऑटोमेटिकली सभी म्यूट ऑटोमेटिक हो रहा है सर यूजीसी से ही मोहित सर सलामकुम गुड मॉर्निंग अनम्यूट कर लिए सर अपने आप यू मैं प्लीज स्टार्ट सर थैंक यू Uh, good morning. Am I audible to you? Good morning, good morning, sir. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Can I start now? Good morning, sir. Good yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. so today we are going to discuss g20 in india the topic that have given to me and uh, first of all uh, you know i want to i wanted to mention that i'll be speaking in english uh, because most of the participants are coming from india somebody from hrdc can you please mute the participants is there anybody from hrdc admin please mute the participants okay okay i think am i audible now yeah yes, yes sir yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, but you all have to mute yourself please mute yourself then only you can hear me it should have been done by somebody from the hrdc i think nobody is here is there anybody from hrdc no admin yes sir yes sir so please mute the participants how can i deliver lecture pardon aap please mute kijiye baaki participants ko maine kar diya sir kar diya so uh, today the topic which has been assigned to me is g20 in india since india got the uh, presidency of g20 so that is why you know it became a momentous occasion for all of us and that was also a lot of celebration in the country you will find uh, of course it it was you know if you see the structure of the g20 it was only by rotation that the presidential uh, presidency is given even then you know it was indeed something that must have been celebrated and we celebrated but now the question arises that if the g20 is there and if this particular organization which appeared you see in the 1990s and after that it became a you know formal organization earlier it was just you know informal kind of meetings between the governors of the reserve bank sometimes finance minister because you see they wanted to manage the financial crisis that was there in asia later on you will find there was global economic crisis in 2008 and from 
then onward you'll find it became a formal organization. Why the G20 is important? Because when we are dealing with G20, keep in mind that we are G not only dealing with 20 or now 21 countries, means 21 in the sense that European Union and African Union plus 19 countries, they are the member. So we are not dealing only with these 21 uh, countries that have become G21 now, but we are also dealing with the, uh, you know, a conglomeration of countries that have come together and which, which accounts for 80% of the world's GDP. You know, it is 80% of the world's GDP that it accounts for. 75% of the global trade and 60% of world population. So this is the reason, you know, this uh, G20 is an organization or G20 is a conglomeration that has assumed this kind of importance. Uh, so, uh, since the participants are from the different parts of the country, and I understand that English is the only lingua franca. So, uh, since our participants are there from northeastern region, from South India as well, and they might not feel comfortable in Hindustani, so I'll be sticking to English, I think. Are you all comfortable with that? Okay. Uh, so, uh, before we move to what we have achieved through G20 or what G20 has achieved under the presidentship, uh, presidentship of India, uh, first of all, you see that it is said that G20 is the best manifestation of interdependence in international relations. When I say interdependence, what does it mean? Uh, you see that we are living in, an, uh, in a world which is interdependent. All countries are interdependent. Even the most powerful countries of the world, like the United States of America, or Britain or France or Germany, they cannot successfully claim that they are self-reliant, self-sufficient in themselves. They are dependent upon other nations for many, many things. For example, you see that uh, European Union or the countries of Europe, they are heavily dependent upon the Russian Federation for their energy needs. Similarly, you see the most of the countries of the world are dependent upon Russia and the countries of of the Middle East for uh, petrol and other things you see. Similarly, for example, China has almost 90% of the uh, rare earth metals. So most of the uh, countries of the world, they are dependent upon China for the supply of rare earth metals. So this is the reason that we can understand that we are living in a world which is, you know, which is, uh, uh, which can be operated only on the basis of interdependence. And this is the reason that no country can afford to live in isolation in this uh, age of interdependence. You know, if a country is isolated, it means that the country is going to face many, many challenges. So this is the reason that, first of all, we have to understand. Now, there are two kinds of approaches you will find so far as the international arena or the international relations is concerned. There is a group of scholars, you know, who belong to the realist school of thought. They say that the international arena, in the international arena, basically what happens that there is a perpetual competition, permanent competition between the nations for domination, for expanding their power, for expanding their area of influence. So when the constant struggle for power is going on, in the international arena. So that is why the relations between, you know, the, when we see the international relations, it is basically conflictual. So the conflict is the permanent feature of the international relations rather than cooperation, number one. Number two, they also argue that the nation states or the country, you know, they are the main actors in the international arena. Thirdly, they also argue that the international, in the international arena, there is a kind of anarchy. Why anarchy is there in the international arena? They say that since all the nation states who are dealing with each other, 
in the international arena, they are basically sovereign nation states. And when we say they are sovereign nation states or the sovereign countries, it means that they are internally supreme and externally free. So since they are all sovereign countries, therefore it becomes difficult for the organizations like the United Nations to regulate their behavior as they these countries can be, uh, regulate the behavior of their citizens and other institutions so that is why even the supranational bodies like the united nations or you see other regional organizations they have to also operate in an inter-state framework so for, for example you see that united nations in an organization you will find headquarters for example in new york so that is a supranational body, an international organization so with 193 members of the member countries. But for every country, you know, it is must that if they want to attend the meeting of the United Nations, then the visa will be processed from the United States of America. You need the visa from there to go to attend the meeting. So, you know, that is, that is why it becomes important to understand that Countries who are dealing in the international relations, they are basically sovereign and independent. And therefore, it becomes difficult, uh, you know, for the organizations like United Nations. <laughs> or even uh, not only United Nations, but you'll find it also becomes uh, difficult for the international law. You know, international law is the weak law. So that is why the international law cannot be applied on all the countries in all circumstances. So this is the reason that what happens finally you will find in the international arena a kind of anarchy prevails. A kind of anarchy prevails in the sense that the powerful countries are able to dominate. And when they are able to dominate, you see the other weaker countries are going to be, uh, you know, on the receiving end. So this is what uh, is believed by one of the schools of thought. On the other hand, you will find the liberal school of thought, those who believe in the liberal internationalism, they say that the countries are interdependent. Trade and commerce is vital for the development and the progress of the countries. So that is why, you know, it is the free trade, the ethics of free trade brings the countries together, the trade and commerce and other economic needs that bring them together. And that's why rather than conflict, we find that the element of cooperation is dominating in the international arena. So that's why you'll find the ambassadorial, you know, things, the diplomacy, etc. You'll find a lot of cooperation, negotiation, deliberation, discussion, all is going on. Because all the countries, they want to maintain prosperity and growth. Uh, and this is the reason that bring them together. And that's why the cooperation is not only possible but we find cooperation in the international arena uh, you know situation may arise when there are some kind of conflict but conflict is something that is always avoided by the country all the country they want to avoid con uh, conflict and they want to go for cooperation so far as the national interest is concerned all the countries they try to promote their national interest most of the time with peaceful means so in this sense you'll find that the liberal internationalism says that there is cooperation and the realists say that there is conflict so this is the two uh, schools of thought now where g20 stands you know g20 when we are discussing it is basically is the manifestation of the element of cooperation that is there in the international arena you'll find countries which are ideologically differ, diverse culturally diverse you know they all have come together and they have come together for what? For progress and development. And that's why we discussed, you know, that the, they are controlling almost 80% of the world GDP and 75% of the world trade. You know, that has brought them together. So this is the reason in the very beginning, you'll find the G20 in the very beginning, in the initial phase, it wanted to develop economic cooperation and economy was the main area. But later on, you'll find slowly and gradually, G20 has become an all kind, all comprehensive kind of conglomeration which is trying to address many issues, for example, you know, the rights of women, human rights, environmental issues, many other things, uh, the security, etc. You will find everything it is trying to uh, address. So that is why this is important. While the debate goes on, you know, uh, about the 
this particular organization the third dimension also you have to keep in mind that the country is many countries they have been blaming that the g20 is basically the ganging up by the major powers of the world major economies of the world to promote their own interests without caring for the interest of other countries of the world so they say that you know the major powers of the world major economies of the world they have come together they have ganged up and they are trying to impose their will upon uh, other countries so that is why that is another dimension of this particular you know g20 conglomeration Come on, you mod, please. You should mute your mic. Participant, please. You should mute your mic. Uh, so, when we are uh, discussing this, India was hosting this in 2023. For example, one of the biggest achievements of that India was hosting it, and you will find how meticulously everything was planned. Now, under this kind of circumstances, when India was hosting, you will find there were two major challenges before India. Two major challenges before India was that the UN, uh, you will find Ukraine-Russia war was going on. And when the UN, uh, uh, Ukraine-Russia war was going on, so the countries of the world were also divided on the issue of Ukraine and Russia. There were countries who were trying to support Russia there were countries who were siding or still siding with uh, Ukraine. And that's why who is right, who is wrong. You know, that kind of debate was already going on. Russia was blaming that it is the eastward expansion of the NATO which is responsible for this conflict. Whereas America and its allies were trying to project the Russian Federation as aggressor. So it means, you know, it is just like Cold War, uh, you know, type of situation where the world was divided into two block. And it was very difficult for India to take side of either of the blocks. And when the, and you will find that Russia, which is a military superpower, with which is also an energy superpower. And, you know, that was in collision course with the Western powers. And that's why. And European Union, United States of America, they all are, you know, the most prominent members of the uh, G20. So that is how to develop consensus on any issue was a big challenge for India. You can understand because, you know, when the other countries were having this kind of uh, uh, meetings, you see earlier, they did not have this kind of challenge. We had, uh, you know, this challenge here. The major powers, for example, Russia and China coming together to protect their own interests. On the other hand, you will find that the uh, other major powers, the United States of America, Britain, France, Germany, they are coming together to protect their interests and also trying to condemn, criticize uh, Russia. India was not in a position to afford to criticize Russia when India was hosting because you see that Russia, Russian Federation or the former Soviet Union has been one of the most reliable partners of India in the international arena. It has always helped us in the time of crisis. So this was the reason that India was not in a position to identify or declare Russia as an aggressor. So because of that, and on the other hand, the Western powers, they wanted that in you know the New Delhi summit, that should identify the aggressor in the Ukraine-Russian war. Under this kind of circumstances, we were hosting the meeting, keep in mind. Then India started, you see now, uh, what is our achievement? India started with high moral ground. And the high moral ground that we took, we borrowed it from our own civilizational value. And that is Vasu Deva Kutumbakam. And that is one earth, one family, one future. That Vasudeva Kutumbakam, we identified it from our own old civilizational value and we said that, you know, the slogan or the theme of the G20 meeting will be one, uh, one earth, one family, one future. That is, you know, the Vasudeva Kutumbakam, you know, the soft power of India. You see that what kind of discourse we are trying to promote at the international. 
so we started with high moral ground and it is a message that the states have to rise above their parochial national interest you see what is being emphasized by india that okay you can promote your national interest but it should not be so parochial that the cooperation at the international level is not possible so that is why all the countries they have to realize the fact that they have to come together and they have to come together to save this planet from the ill effects of global warming and climate change, environmental degradation, etc. At the same time, if the wars and conflicts are there everywhere, we have to realize that peace is the only way to survive. You know, this is what India wanted to promote at this level. You see, the criticism that was already being made when India was hosting within our own country from the intellectual circle and from outside that had been there again the G20 was that number one was G20 the forum to save and promote capitalism through the promotion of neoliberal policies. You see that it, this uh, this blame is always there uh, that G20 is nothing but a forum to promote global capitalism. You know, an ideological tinge you will find in it. But even then, you know, this has been there. Why? Because after all, these countries are trying to promote capitalism. They want to universalize capitalism, universalization of capitalism in the name of globalization. So ultimately, what is happening that this is a forum or this is a Kongli variation of the countries who are trying to impose capitalism upon all other nations of the world. And that's why they are also trying to follow a neoliberal agenda where states, you know, the welfare states, they have to withdraw the public services, they have to go for cutbacks, and everything should be privatized. So, you see, from the service oriented state, they want to make it a profit oriented, uh, you know, market oriented state, where the role of the state will be only like a empire in a cricket match or referee in a football match and that rule is something that the developing countries or the countries of the global south cannot afford you know this kind of role of the state will be good for the advanced countries of the global north but not for the poor and developing underdeveloped countries of africa asia and latin america you know this was uh, already uh, highlighted the second thing was that you know g20 have been ignoring the needs of the global south global south you see earlier what was the position now many countries from the global south they have also rose to this position like india brazil argentina you will find south africa many other countries but you'll find earlier the global south was very poor almost uh, you know 70 80 percent of the world population living in the global south was having only 20% of the world's income and resources. And the 20% of the world population living in global north was enjoying with 80% of the world's wealth and resources. So this was the position. So therefore, that was another criticism. And you can understand the pressure on India. Third, it was also, you know, observed that 19 plus European Union, almost 40 odd countries coming together and means not coming together rather they are ganging up to subjugate other weaker countries so you see for example in the united nations there are 193 members and this uh, g20 is basically a conglomeration of, of 40 plus countries so under this kind of circumstances you see what can we say that this is ganging up of the major powers of the world and ignoring the needs of other weaker uh, nations of the world now there was a lot of expectation from india why expectation from india because you see the historical role or the traditional role that india has played in the international arena and that is when the world was divided into two hostile blocks socialist and capitalist and it was very difficult for the newly liberated countries to take sides because they needed help from both the blocks they wanted to avoid conflict, war and all, and they wanted to consolidate their independence. These were the countries who were looted and plundered 
for centuries by the colonial powers. So that is why they wanted to concentrate on development and progress. So that is why they never wanted to join either of the blocks. So India, you know, led from the front and you'll find that it was because of India and few other countries that, you know, NAG was introduced in the international arena, that is non-aligned movement. So India has been the leader of the non-aligned movement. So it guided the, you know, the global south at that time when world was already facing hostility between the two blocks. So that is a lot of expectation was from, uh, was there from India when the G20 was being hosted in India. Uh, what was the major challenge for India? Consensus building on issues like global warming and climate change. You know, that was a major challenge. These days, you will find a lot of uh, attention is being paid to the issue of global warming, climate change, ozone depletion. You will find right from the school books to the, uh, you know, serious academia, you will find a lot of discussion is there on global warming, climate change. And it is being said that our planet is heating up. And if our planet is heating up, then a time will come that every living creature will be wiped out from this planet. And we are going to face doomsday. So the doomsday predictions are already there. And because of that, you will find that uh, environmental issues are becoming major issues. But whenever environmental issues, means global warming and climate change, the, these issues are discussed at the international fora, you will find there is blame game that is witnessed. The two major issues that are always highlighted relating to the global warming and climate change. Why? Because, you know, first of all, we have to understand that the world is convinced and experts have already pointed out that the global warming and climate change is there because of the human activities. Because of the human activities in the sense, you know, anthropogenic activities, it is said that because of industrialization, because of the green greenhouse gas emissions, because of the deforestation, you know, the, our planet is heating up. So human beings are to be blamed because we have become self-destructive. For example, you see that how, in, in a sense, we all are environmental terrorists. We all are environmental terrorists in the sense we all, you know, we all are here in this space. We all have ACs at our home, AC in our car. So what the AC does, you know, if you have two ACs at your home, it means that you can make your own space cozy, comfortable, very cool when the temperature outside will be 45 degrees in our country in the month of June. So you'll find when the temperature outside is June, July, when the temperature is 45 degrees, you are trying to make your own space cozy and comfortable by using AC. But don't you think that, you know, when we are using AC in our cars and in our house, we are also responsible for heating up of our planet because we can make our own space very comfortable. But what about the people, those who are living just in our neighborhood and they might not be having AC in their home? So, you know, at the cost of, you know, at the cost of the, uh, you know, these people, those who are living in the neighborhood and they don't have AC, for say, for example, there may be a window of some person and uh, that my AC is going to, you see, uh, create that kind of heat which is going to affect his uh, house. But he has not done anything. You know, that person is facing problem yeah, yeah, or our neighborhood is uh, facing problem because of me, because I am having AC. So it means I am responsible for heating up of the planet. In that sense, we become environmental terrorists or the use of polythenes and all that you all know. We all are using this. So this is the uh, reason that it is said that, first of all, individuals are to be blamed because they are not sensitized enough to understand that, you know, the... Uh, you know, we are sharing this planet with other, and that's why the theme was important. You know, this is one planet. It is one future and one people that we have to understand. So, uh, from this point of view, we will find that the theme was very much relevant. Then, what happens whenever this meeting is going on, on the issue of global warming, you will find two kinds of arguments are advanced. Number one, historical responsibility. 
So you'll find that the countries of global south, including India, you know, they argue that the global warming and climate change or ozone depletion or the greenhouse gas emission that you are seeing in the atmosphere, it is because of the industrialization of the global north for a, for a long time. You see, they had industrialized themselves in 18th century. So from 18th century, so for last 300 years, more than 300 years, they have been, uh, you know, uh, emitting greenhouse green, uh, gases in the atmosphere. So they have been polluting our planet for the last 300 years. Whereas we got independence in 1947, for example, and then most of the countries will find out the global south. And that's why we started our developmental work from 1950s onwards. So that is why what is our contribution to the global warming and climate change? So the major responsibility of mitigating the ill effects of global warming and climate change is of the global north. Because the global north is responsible for deforestation. Global north is responsible for, you know, uh, this kind of industrialization. So that is one thing that has been, uh, you know, pointed out. You see in our own country, for example, there was already a debate between Jawaharlal Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi because Mahatma Gandhi wanted that in our country, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of development and model we should adopt? He said that all production must be in complete harmony with nature. And that's why he emphasized cottage industries, village-based economy, self-reliant villages. He was against, you know, big industries, mechanization, industrialization, and also against this kind of urbanization that we are seeing, uh, that the people are living in slums in very adverse conditions and also away from their emotionally supportive environment. You know, all the people, those who have migrated from rural areas to urban areas, from villages to big cities, they have, you know, gone away from emotionally supportive environment. You just imagine your village where, you know, uh, you know, in five, six villages, you know, every person, but here you are in a crowd, nobody knows you and you are also not knowing um, others, you know. So very hostile kind of uh, environment you, you face. So therefore, you see that that debate was already there. So here, you know, this industrialization is uh, there and for uh, the in the post-industrial revolution age, you will find these countries, the, the countries of the global north, they have been polluting the environment and that is why it is their responsibility, first of all, to see what has to be done for the mitigation of ill effects of global warming and climate change. Number two argument is that you'll find the blame game goes on at the international forum. These days you'll find China, India, other countries, other countries of the global south. They are basically blamed for, you know, greenhouse gas emission. What is the argument of, you know, on most of the issues you'll find India and China, they may fight, but they come together on this issue. Because, you know, China and India, they are the two uh, most populous nations of the world. So much so that you will find around 38% of the world population is living in these countries, in these two countries. So when the greenhouse gas emission issue is discussed, so India and China, they have been arguing that it is the per capita greenhouse gas emission that is important. It is, so the country should not be taken as a unit to calculate that how much these countries are contributing to the greenhouse gas emission and to the ozone depletion, global warming and climate change. So argument is that you have to see the population of these countries. So say for example, 38% to 40% of the world population living in these two countries. So that is why you have to see the per capita greenhouse gas emission. You have to see the per capita, uh, you see is just energy consumption. So, and if you com compare the per capita energy consumption of these countries with the countries of the global north, you will find they are, you know, consuming more in comparison to the these countries. So that is why the energy consumption you have to see first of all. You know, how luxurious like these people are living and how much they are responsible for global warming and climate change. So that is why the per capita greenhouse gas emission, that is also one of the arguments. So you find there are many other arguments, you know, because of the paucity of time, you cannot discuss all those things here. But because of this, you will find that it becomes very difficult to develop consensus 
on the issue of global warming and climate change and the roles of the countries that are to be assigned to them. So that was also a major challenge uh, before India. Another important issue is that you uh, and you'll find newspapers, articles, and the you know interviews on the TV that India should address the issue of sovereign debt crisis. Sovereign debt crisis, you will find. What is the sovereign debt crisis? It means most of the countries of the world, especially the countries of the global south, they are reeling under heavy debt that they have taken from World Bank or IMF or from other countries of the world. You'll find we also discuss China's debt trap these days. So it means most of the uh, countries, they are facing what is known as sovereign debt crisis. And for which you cannot blame these countries only who are under heavy debt, but you have to also blame the global economic order, which is unjust. Which So because of that global economic order, you'll find that the countries of the global south are under heavy debt. And there are many countries who are just going to be bankrupt. You see what happened in Sri Lanka recently. So the countries are facing this kind of problem. And if that is happening, then uh, something must be done. It should be addressed. Because it is the trinity. The trinity, when I say, the trinity means uh, the three important global financial and trade institutions, uh, which are controlled by the major powers of the world. And this trinity, uh, is number one world bank number two international monetary fund and number three world trade organization so you know this is called trinity every kind of trade and commerce you know that is controlled by them the debt is controlled by them so these three important global financial and trade institutions they are dictating terms to other countries of the world and these three institutions are dominated and you know controlled by the major powers of the world so that is why how to address this issue of sovereign debt crisis. You know, how to develop or how to achieve the goal of uh, what is called the just international economic order based on equality. You know, that is another challenge and that's why that expectation was also there from India. Uh, then you'll find another issue is increasing mass poverty. That increasing mass poverty is there in the world, including our own country. And you'll find G20 has never addressed this issue in a way it should have addressed. You see, 80% of the world uh, GDP and 75% of the global trade, if they are controlling, then it is their responsibility also to see why this mass poverty is increasing day by day in the world. You see, uh, as a teacher, we must have been telling our student uh, that, look, globalization has created a lot of opportunity and revenues for you. You know, we, we say. We, we tell them in the class that you have to develop the, you know, instinct to compete in this world. In a way, we are preaching social Darwinism. Even the teachers of humanities, you know, they are also preaching social Darwinism, means survival of the fittest. So the su survival of the fittest in the competitive world, you have to become, you know, the you have to believe in survival of the fittest. So without caring for the cooperation, sympathy, love and compassion that we should try to inculcate in our classes. So you know, this is the world where we are trying to make this student very competitive and uh, they, we want to inculcate the instinct of survival of the fittest. So you see, uh, because of that, you know, there are many problems uh, in, uh, that we are facing. So what, what happens basically, why mass poverty is uh, increasing? Have we ever tried to address the issue of farmer suicide in our country? From 1997 to 2010, it is estimated by some organizations, not, uh, of course, endorsed by the government of India, that 5 lakh farmers have committed suicide in India. And if you see the recorded history of the world, it is the highest number of the farmer suicide. It is called mass suicide of the farmers. And why it has happened from 1997 to 2000 and why this date uh, I'm mentioning because this is the time that we, when we liberalized our economy in 1991, after that it was almost near 1997 that we opened agricultural sector for the multinational corporations or the, you know, we invited uh, FDI in the agricultural sector. And then it started the high yielding, high yielding variety of seeds, chemical fertilizers and all. 
and because of that you will find that the poor and small farmer they started facing problem those who are uh, into this kind of uh, you know agriculture and all they know that the high yielding variety of seeds are planted and the chemical fertilizers are used in one uh, field then it is going to affect the fields of other if they are going for what is called the desi seed and all indigenous so that is why you know because of that uh, and the role of money lenders in the rural areas because when you are going to buy uh, you know high yielding variety of seeds you have to also buy the package means chemical fertilizers and keep in mind one thing why this g20 is criticized because why it is said that it is trying to promote uh, capitalism and global uh, ethics of capitalism because we will find that the high yielding varieties uh, of seeds are genetically modified to lose you know to lose their reproductive uh, capacity it means once you have taken high yielding variety of seeds you cannot uh, you know save the same seed for the next crop desi mein hum log kya karte hain hum log beej rakh lete hain fir dusre saal uska istemal karte hain that you cannot do with the high yielding variety of seeds aapko dobara kharidna padega fir usi company se और उसके साथ आप केमिकल फर्टिलाइजर ही यूज करेंगे वो भी वही कंपनी प्रोवाइड करेगी दैट यू कैन नॉट यूज योर सेल्फ अपने यहां से नहीं कर सकते सो बिकॉज ऑफ दैट द स्मॉल फार्मर्स दे आर यू नो यू नो दे आर कंपेल टू सेल और दे फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल दे टेक मनी फ्रॉम द मनी लेंडर आफ्टर दैट व्हेन द क्रॉप इज फेलिंग दे आर नॉट इन अ पोजीशन टू रीपे एंड दैट इज व्हाई दे आर फोर्स टू सेल देयर हाउस एंड यू सी व्हाट इज कॉल्ड देयर you know field their farm uh, you know uh, their farm houses of course they don't have of course their field that they have been cultivating so and maxim gorgi ki the mother yaad rakhiye you know it is when a farmer is going to sell his land or his field it is just like selling his mother so you see and this has happened in our country so because of that who will address these issues and that's why you see this was a criticism after g20 also that you know these people means the mass poverty that globalization has created in this country you know these people are away from the gaze of the media and everything good was projected uh, and it is the practice of all the countries of, of the g20 so that is why you know this issue is also there lastly you will find that the G20 countries, if you see, the G20 countries are also responsible for the 80 to 90 percent of the global arms trade that the arms race is going on. And you see, these countries who are talking all good things in the meetings, they are responsible for selling and buying the weapons in the international market, arms and weapons. and because of their supply of arms and weapons you will find that the global peace is disturbed because of their supply and you know purchase and sale of weapons you will find that there is a mad race for arms and ammunition so what is happening that the resources of the vital resources of the human beings or humanity are being diverted towards destructive purposes you know for nuclear bombs for nuclear weapons for intercontinental ballistic missiles and you will find there is a significant trade you know increase in the defense budget of all the countries of the world and if you see the g20 countries especially you know how much they are spending on the arms trade um, or you know for the acquisition possession development of arms and weapons so that issue who will address so you find human rights organizations social activists serious scholars who don't believe you know those who say that you know we have to transcend national boundaries and all to become you know the citizen of one planet and we have to march towards global governance all these kind of argument that is advanced so that issue also became uh, something very very important and lastly you will find that let's see what this g20 does especially when india is hosting so far as you see to negotiate uh, with russia and ukraine to maintain peace and to stop the war of course you see that was also expectation from uh, india under uh, this kind of circumstance the us india hosted this uh, you know g20 now what is the achievement 
if all these challenges were there, were we successful in doing this? So I, I told you in the very beginning that India started on the high moral ground, and we declared that uh, we we declared that it, it is Vasudeva Kutumakam that will be the theme, and from there you will find that the first major achievement of India is including African Union in the G20. You know, first time it happened that if you see the uh, global south. Then it was India that proposed and created agreement among all the members of the G20 to include the African Union in the G20. And that's why it is said that now G20 has become G21 because 19 countries plus European Union and plus African Union. So that is why it is the biggest achievement of the G20 that was hosted in India. And under the presidency of uh, India, you know, the African Union has got the membership of the G20. So that is one of the biggest achievements that uh, that was there. Then another issue was, you know, on the because the G20 countries were divided into the issue of Ukraine and Russia. That was the most vital issue that was being faced by the international community. So at that time, you see what happened that India recognized, you know, consensus building was the most important thing. So you will find that India tactfully did one thing, that it recognized the conflict between Russia and Ukraine without identifying aggressor. You know, India did not declare that who is aggressor. So that way the consensus was built up and you will find all the countries, they agreed upon it, that yes, recognition of the conflict, which must be, you know, a stop that was there, but India made it clear that it is not going to identify the aggressor. And the Western power, they wanted that Russia should be declared as, a, as an aggressor. But India did not do that. Keep in mind that with, despite sanction, India was buying oil from Russia. India did not abandon Russia. And under this kind of circumstances, you uh, will find that what happened, we did not identify the aggressor, but also there was the recognition of the conflict and the concern was shown for the loss of life and all in Ukraine and Russia. So, you know, that is one of the, uh, you see, master strokes that India was able to achieve um, uh, in the G20 meeting. Why India did not identify? Now you can say that Russia had uh, invaded Ukraine. It had already annexed Crimea in 2014. And now it, it has already annexed uh, Donbass region. And it is moving forward. So India should have done this. India should have condemned Russia or India should have identified R Russia as an uh, you aggressor but you have to see you know when we are going to deal with our foreign policy first of all you have to see what has happened in that region you see when soviet union disintegrated in 1990s and 91 and russian federation made what is called the commonwealth of independent states so russia declared that all the countries who were earlier the members of the soviet union that is post-Soviet space and post-Soviet space means that is the Russian sphere of influence and that is why the United States of America and other countries they should not try you know these countries they should not try to just a minute So, uh, you know, these countries should not try uh, uh, this uh, United States of America and other European power to go for eastward expansion of NATO. Whereas NATO is a military land that was there during the Cold War. There was no justification for the continuance of the NATO, which is the largest military alliance of the world. So, you see that NATO should not try to expand uh, towards east and it should not include other countries in it, especially the countries of the former Soviet Union. But, you know, NATO did not pay heed. And in 2004, you will find that the three Baltic republics, that is Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, these three Baltic republics were included in NATO. And that was a direct threat to Russian Federation, to its security. Then you will find Georgia, and Ukraine were encouraged to join NATO. Russia 
always warned that it is just like crossing the red line and we will not tolerate it. But you see, Georgia was hell bent upon joining. Then Russia, first of all, protested. And in 2008, Russia intervened in Georgia. Again, you know, there was negotiation by the European Union, especially France negotiated, and then Russian Federation withdrew. Again, you know, Georgia wanted to become, then Russia invaded. Russia entered in Georgia with its military in 2011 and created two states out of Georgia, carved out two states, that is South Ossetia and Abkhazia. South Ossetia and Abkhazia. It is because Georgia wanted to join NATO and Russia felt that it is a direct threat to Russian security. So the provocation was from NATO, not from Russia. Keep in mind. Last year you will find that the Ukraine again wanted to become the member of the NATO. Uh, NATO. Russia again protested. They did not pay heed. Then Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. Again, Ukraine was hell bent upon, especially Zelensky wanted to join. He was in a hurry to join NATO. And, you know, the uh, NATO was also in a hurry to give recognition uh, to Ukraine and include it under uh, NATO. So that is why, you know, Russia was forced to intervene. India stands or uh, understands all these issues. And this was the reason that India was not ready to, uh, you know, identify Russia as an aggressor. And I think this is the best kind of foreign policy that India followed, for which India should be appreciated. Because, you know, Russia had not abandoned us in 1971. Russia had not abandoned us in 1965. And that's why even Russia had not abandoned us in 1962 as well. So this is the reason that, you know, consistently one policy that we have followed. And because of that, India did not recognize Russia as an aggressor, rather recognize the conflict over there. So that consensus was also achieved in this G20 meeting. Uh, then, if you see all 83 paragraphs of the New Delhi Leaders Declaration, you know, there are 83 paragraphs that you can read. It is already there in the public domain. It is there in the Google. You can read it. So you'll find that shows that how India has been able to develop consensus. And that is the best manifestation of consensus building. Eight paras were devoted to Ukraine-Russian war and a subsequent economic implications. Then the issue of climate change and global warming. You will find emphasis on what was there that that emphasis was there on developing a fund for mitigating the ill effects of climate change and global warming. And the target was set that we are going to achieve what is called zero greenhouse gas emission by 2050. Of course, an ambitious dream, an ambitious target. But at least, you know, this target was set and that is why it is a big achievement from that point of view that the countries are trying to achieve the zero, zero greenhouse gas emission to mitigate the ill effects of global warming and climate change. So that is also one of the big achievements. And lastly, the another important achievement was India, Middle East, Europe Economic Corridor. You know, this is the biggest achievement of if you see the long-term interest of India and many other countries are going to be uh, promoted through what is called India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor that has been proposed. And if we are successful in uh, you know, doing this, it means India is going to be immensely benefited and other countries are also going to be immensely benefited. So from uh, this point of view, you will find that we can declare that G20 uh, meeting or summit under the presidency of India was a major success, keeping in view other summits of the G20. So therefore, for this, uh, you know, India must be appreciated. But one criticism that was there and that I feel was genuine criticism, that India should have been vocal on the issue of what is called economic sanction, the politics of economic sanction. The politics of economic sanction, why? Because you see that uh, our own Raghu Ram Rajan declared that economic sanctions, for example, Russia is facing economic sanction. You will find Venezuela had faced economic sanction. Libya has faced economic sanction. Iraq has faced, Iran is facing you know, economic sanction. North Korea is facing economic sanction. Many countries they have faced. So that is why India, the country, should have uh, you know, highlighted this issue of economic sanction 
बिकॉज इकोनॉमिक सैंक्शन और इकोनॉमिक वेपन्स ऑफ मास डिस्ट्रक्शन वेन द इकोनॉमिक सैंक्शन इज इम्पोज ऑन अ कंट्री कीप इन माइंड दैट द रूलर आर नॉट गोइंग टू फेस मोस्ट ऑफ द प्रॉब्लम अल्टीमेटली द पीपल आर गोइंग टू बियर द ब्रांड when the people are bearing the brunt because of inflation you will find turmoil turbulence will be there in the state civil war like situation may develop in that state so this economic sanction which is most of the time have been used by you know the western powers are the very strong weapon in their hands because they control the world bank international monetary fund world trade organization so they have this kind of power and that is why this economic sanctions are becoming economic terrorism so that's why india since it have been leading the uh, the developing countries of the global south that is one issue that should be addressed by india if it could not address in 2023 then later on it must take up this issue with the help of other countries or like minded countries and this politics of economic sanction must be discouraged because after all if the sanction is going on for example if there is sanction against russia you find it is going to create problem for the european union as well because the 40% of their energy needs the country the european need uh, european country you know countries they are heavily dependent upon russia for their energy needs so ultimately this sanction the political sanction must be discarded that is one thing which have been pointed out by most of the scholars so with this i am going to conclude uh, my lecture because you all are teachers you have many things to share thank you very much i am very sorry because i could not switch over to hindustani but i think my english is as easy as hindustani for you thank you very much now the class is open for discussion observation question whatever you want sir uh, ek uh... आपके पर्सनल बारे में जानना था सर आपका नाम तो मैंने देखा सर लेकिन आप कहा से है सर कौन से डिपार्टमेंट से है सर आप आपके बारे में आई एम आई एम फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ पॉलिटिकल साइंस अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी एंड हमर बॉडी वर्क आसनसोल अच्छा अच्छा सर आसनसोल अच्छा सर हमर हमर एक्चुअल बॉडी पूर्व वर्तमान किंतु ओखारे चक्कर में है अच्छा थैंक यू व्हाट डू यू की आई टीच हिस्ट्री सर आई माय माय सब्जेक्ट इज हिस्ट्री गुड गुड मॉर्निंग सर morning sir uh, hello yes please go ahead uh, so i had two questions i'll be very precise first of all my name is rohit kumar jha um an assistant professor of physics at unpg college padrona it's in eastern up koshinagar district basically mm, i know i know so uh, my first question was uh, as of now there are at least uh, 10 or 20 corporations on this planet whose economies are bigger than at least 170 countries for example apple itself has a uh, a greater annual turnover than the economies of uh, than the combined your communication was broken please go ahead is there any problem with your wifi or network problem rohit rohit please we can take another question i think he is rohit is there any problem with you i think some network problem please some other anybody can... else anybody else ask the question yes. uh, morning sir morning uh, sir mai pradeep singh गवर्नमेंट कॉलेज माचीवाड़ा पंजाब से हूँ सर जी जी सर जैसे अभी जी सर तो जैसे सर अभी आपने जिक्र किया जाए यूक्रेन और रशिया का जो चल रहा अभी वॉर चल रही है सर जी तो इंडिया इसमें अपना रोल क्या सही ढंग से प्ले कर पा रहा है सर 
आप इंडिया से क्या एक्सपेक्ट कर सकते हैं इस कॉन्फ्लिक्ट में यानी जहां पे रशिया और यूक्रेन की वॉर चल रही है इंडिया ज्यादा ज्यादा निगोशिएट कर सकता है आपको ये याद करना चाहिए कि जो रशिया है वो हमारा एक रिलायबल पार्टनर रहा है राइट फ्रॉम द वेरी बिगनिंग इसलिए सर और दूसरी बात ये है कि अगर आप देखें हमारे जो आर्म्स एंड वेपन्स है वी आर हेवली डिपेंडेंट अपॉन रशिया फॉर देयर मेंटेनेंस एंड ऑल्सो फॉर न्यू वेपन्स ये एक बड़ी चीज है तीसरी अहम बात ये है कि जो जो रशियन फेडरेशन उसकी वार अगर यूक्रेन से चल रही है तो ये दो कंट्रीज के बीच का मामला है इंडिया एज अ यू नो एक्साइटिंग इकोनॉमिक पावर एंड लार्जेस्ट डेमोक्रेसी लार्जेस्ट इलेक्टोरल डेमोक्रेसी ऑफ द वर्ल्ड उसमें ऑफर कर सकता है निगोशिएशन मेडिएशन इससे ज्यादा कुछ नहीं कर सकता दैट वी हैव बिन ट्राइंग टू डू बट यू फाइंड द इशूज आर देयर सो दैट इज वाई जिसे कहते हैं ना बेगाने के शादी में अब्दुल्ला दीवाना Hmm. तो उसमें कोई हमारा बहुत ज्यादा इतना बड़ा रोल नहीं हो सकता है कि हम उसमें इंटरवीन कर लें यानी दिस इज हम ज्यादा ज्यादा यही कर सकते हैं जो हम कर रहे हैं जी तो मैं समझता हूँ कि इंडिया का परफेक्ट रोल है जो एक कंट्री को करना चाहिए कीपिंग ओन नेशनल इंटरेस्ट तो वो हम करने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं थैंक यू सर नमस्कार नमस्कार मेरा नाम निखिल आनंद गिरी है मैं पटना के मौलाना मजहर उल्लाक यूनिवर्सिटी में जर्नलिज्म पढ़ाता हूँ इसके पहले दिल्ली में था और वहाँ पर जी ट्वेंटी का सारा तमाशा देखा मैंने तमाशा इसलिए कह रहा हूँ क्योंकि दिल्ली मेट्रो में था और इतना ज्यादा पॉम्पस इतना ज्यादा वेस्ट ऑफ मनी मैंने पहले कई सालों में नहीं देखा था जी के नाम पर जो हुआ तो बाकी मैं आपसे ये जानना चाहता हूँ कि एज अ डेवलपिंग इकोनॉमी मतलब हमारा रोल मतलब चूंकि वी हैव सीन मेनी अदर जैसे रोहित जी पूछ रहे थे कि और भी कई सारे ऑर्गेनाइजेशंस में आ, हम रहे हैं या दुनिया में बहुत सारे एसोसिएशन हैं इस जी ट्वेंटी की रिलायबिलिटी मतलब रिक्वायरमेंट जरूरत क्यों है मतलब इसके बिना भी तो काम चल सकता था बिकॉज वी हैव नॉट टेकन एनी गुड स्टैंड वी हैव नॉट टेकन एनी वी हैव नॉट एड्रेस एनी की इशू टू द सोल्यूशन अगर आप देखेंगे तो मैं समझता हूँ कि जी ट्वेंटी का ये जो क्रिटिसिज्म है कि इट इज लीडिंग टू व्हाट इज कॉल्ड यूनिवर्सलाइजेशन ऑफ कैपिटलिज्म मैं इससे एग्री करता हूँ कि यू नो इट इज ट्राइंग टू प्रमोट ग्लोबल कैपिटलिज्म देर इज नो डाउट इन इट बट देखिए एटलीस्ट जो डेलीब्रेशन या डिस्कशन के लिए मेजर पावर्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड को एक ऐसा प्लेटफॉर्म मिला हुआ है कि अभी याद कीजिए कि अभी इकोनॉमी जो है उसमें इकोनॉमिक नेशनलिज्म ऐसी चीज है ना जिसे आजकल बहुत ज्यादा हाईलाइट नहीं किया जाता है तो प्रॉब्लम क्या है कि वी आर नॉट इसको इंटरडिपेंडेंट नहीं कहेंगे मैं ये कहूंगा कि वी आर डिपेंडेंट डिपेंडेंट का मतलब ये होता है कि फ्यू मेजर पावर्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड दे कैन गैंग अप जिसको कहते हैं इकोनॉमिक पावर्स और वो किसी भी कंट्री की इकोनॉमी को कलेप्स करने में एक बड़ा रोल प्ले कर सकती हैं आज की देर में और ये ये जो जो सिचुएशन है वो बहुत ही प्रिकेरियस सिचुएशन है अगर आप देखें इंटरनेशनल अरिना में और यही वजह है कि जो वेस्टर्न डोमिनेशन है वो आज भी उसी तरह से कायम है उसकी वजह यह है कि दे कैन गैंग अप एंड दे कैन विद्रॉ फॉर एग्जांपल अगर एफडीआई एक साथ कुछ कंट्रीज ने और उनके मल्टीनेशनल कॉर्पोरेशन ने हटा लिया तो आप समझते हैं कि एक इकोनॉमी जिसे कहते हैं बैसाखियों पर इकोनॉमी हो गई तो ये जो चीज है इससे मैं बिल्कुल इनकार नहीं करता एज ए स्टूडेंट ऑफ पोलिटिकल साइंस जो मेरी पुअर अंडरस्टैंडिंग है मैं ये समझता हूँ कि योर कंसर्न इज जेन्यून बट आप इस बात से इनकार नहीं कर सकते कि बहरहाल ये एक ऐसा प्लेटफॉर्म है कि जिसमें मेजर इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस को या हाउ टू मैनेज द डिप्रेशन लाइक सिचुएशन इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस सिचुएशन इस पर कम से कम कंसेंस बिल्डिंग बना सकते हैं एक ऐसा प्लेटफॉर्म मिला हुआ है जिसमें बैठ करके आप डिलीवरेट अप ऑन कर सकते हैं और उसमें यानी इंडिया और बहुत सारी और कंट्रीज मिल करके जैसे हमने अफ्रीकन यूनियन को शामिल इसमें कर लिया तो वही वी हैव बिकम ए स्ट्रॉगर तो मैं ये समझता हूँ कि उसके साथ मिल करके एक हम कंसेंस बिल्डिंग बहुत सारे इश्यूज पे बना सकते हैं तो एक पॉजिटिव uh, डायरेक्शन में मूव तो कर रहे हैं यू नो दिस वाज़ अ गैंग ऑफ द मेजर पावर्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड इकोनॉमिक पावर्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड बट नाउ यू सी कंट्रीज लाइक इंडिया चाइना रशिया दे हैव स्टार्टेड ऑपरेटिंग और यू नो फाइंडिंग देयर स्पेस सो दट वाइज मैं ये समझता हूँ कि uh, इस तरह से ये एक बड़ा प्लेटफॉर्म है जहां तक एक्स्ट्रा वैगंजा का बात है ये बहुत सारे पैसे खर्च हुए जो जो क्रिटिसिज्म रहा है गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया का तो वो देखिए ये एक वाइब्रेंट डेमोक्रेसी की पहचान है कि उसमें जो एस्टेब्लिशमेंट है उसका क्रिटिसिज्म होना चाहिए उसमें आपको अकाउंटेबल बनाना चाहिए उनका असेसमेंट होना चाहिए लेकिन कीपिंग इन व्यू फॉर एग्जांपल जो हमने अचीव किया जिसका मैं बहुत हाईलाइट कर रहा था 
कि इंडिया मिडिल ईस्ट यूरोप इकोनॉमिक कॉरिडोर ये आप कम बड़ा अचीवमेंट समझते हैं आने वाले दिनों में अगर इसमें हम सक्सेसफुल होते हैं तो ये बड़ा चैलेंज है इसको अचीव करना बट बेल्ट एंड रोड इनिशिएटिव जो चाइना का है उसका काउंटर क्या हो सकता था तो अगर इंडिया ने ये अचीव कर लिया और अगर ऐसा होता है तो अल्टीमेटली मैं ये समझता हूँ कि आने वाले दिनों में इसका बहुत बड़ा इम्पैक्ट होगा हमारी इकोनॉमी पे या ये पूरे पूरे डायनेमिक्स को चेंज करने में तो मैं ये समझता हूँ कि अचीवमेंट और फेलियर्स को देखेंगे तो यू कैन नॉट सेट इट वॉज समिंग वेरी डिसअपॉइंटिंग और कीपिंग व्यू द इकोनॉमिक लॉट ऑफ इंडिया आई थिंक दैट मनी दैट वॉज स्पेंड फॉर होस्टिंग जी समिट दैट इज नॉट समथिंग दैट वॉज बिग इतने तो बहुत बहुत सारी और चीजों में खर्च हो जाते हैं नहीं सर बात है वैलिडिटी ऑफ दिस ऑर्गेनाइज मतलब दिस काइंड ऑफ यूनियंस आप तो पॉलिटिकल साइंस के स्कॉलर हैं मतलब मैम से लेते सार्क होते हुए कहां तक हम कितना कुछ देख चुके इसकी जरूरत ही क्या है अगर आप देखिए तो यूनाइटेड नेशंस से भी क्या हमें अचीव कर पा रहे हैं जो कहते हैं यानी क्रिटिसिज्म यूनाइटेड नेशंस का भी यही है ना कि यूनाइटेड नेशंस इट हैज नॉट बीन एबल टू प्रिवेंट वॉर्स इन द वर्ल्ड एग्जैक्टली ये ये बड़ा अचीवमेंट नहीं है कि इन 19 यू नो द फर्स्ट वर्ल्ड वॉर एंडेड इन 1919 एंड द सेकंड वर्ल्ड स्टार्टेड इन 1939 बट सिंस 1945 देयर हैज नॉट बीन थर्ड वर्ल्ड वॉर डिस्पाइट यू नो मेनी मेनी ट्रिगर्स यू नो दैट वर गोइंग टू uh develop a situation under which there would have been third world war so still that you can appreciate united nations for providing a platform where you know the countries can sit together and discuss and secondly the united nations role in providing global health uh, refugee crisis for example who will manage if for example if the united nations is not there the refugee crisis for example you will find many other issues that uh the united nations other agencies are doing forget about security council which is of course dominated by the fig by big bosses or the privileged nations of the world but you will find for example world health organization unicef for example unhcr for example you know they are playing commendable role sir yes here mahmud alam from patna university farmaiye sir mai puch raha hu ki abhi jo gaza mein genocide chal raha hai usko leke g20 ka kya stand hai गदा जेनोसाइड पे जुटेंटी का कोई स्टैंड नहीं है गदा जेनोसाइड पे अगर आप देखेंगे तो आप अंदाजा लगाइए कि यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका जो ये डिक्लेयर करता है कि उसके फॉरेन पॉलिसी जो गाइड होती है उसमें ह्यूमन राइट्स डेमोक्रेसी और पीस तीन इंपॉर्टेंट कंसिडरेशन है वही यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका वीटो किसको कर रहा है यूएन सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल में ये यूनाइटेड नेशंस में सीज फायर को वीडियो कर रहा है बंदा तो लगाइए यानी जेनोसाइड बंद करने के लिए रेजोल्यूशन लाया जा रहा है और उस जेनोसाइड को कंटिन्यू करने के लिए यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका इंटरवीन कर रहा है तो अल्टीमेटली ये तो बिल्कुल क्लियर है कि जहां तक गादा का सवाल है उस पर जी ट्वेंटी का कोई स्टैंड नहीं है और जानते हैं हो भी नहीं सकता इस इशू पे चूंकि दैट वॉज नॉट एन इशू दैट वॉज बींग डिस्कस एट दैट टाइम तो ये जो गादा वॉर है पैलेस्टाइन पे बहरहाल कंट्रीज का अपना अपना स्टैंड है मोस्ट ऑफ द कंट्रीज दे हैव ऑलरेडी यू नो मेड इट क्लियर दैट दे बिलीव इन टू स्टेट सॉल्यूशन टू स्टेट सॉल्यूशन पैलेस्टाइन पैलेस्टाइन मस्ट गेट व्हाट इज कॉल्ड सॉवरेंटी एंड इंडिपेंडेंस सो दैट इज वन थिंग बट ये रोल तो आपने देखा है कि यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका ब्रिटेन वीटो किसको कर रहा है यानी जेनोसाइड कंटिन्यू करने के लिए सो इफ दिस इज द पोजिशन दैट डबल स्टैंडर्ड इफ यू आर सींग तो आप उसमें क्या कर सकते हैं यानी सर ये हुआ कि ह्यूमैनिटी को लेके जी ट्वेंटी का कोई स्टैंड नहीं है बड़ी बड़ी बातें तो है जैसे बात तो किया गया ना कि हम ही कह रहे हैं देवा को मतुम फॉर एग्जांपल तो अल्टीमेटली यानी वन प्लैनेट वन पीपल वन फ्यूचर इसकी बात तो हम कर रहे हैं ना तो ये बात तो कर रहे हैं बट इसमें कितनी कंट्रीज ये थिंक करती है आप डोंट यू थिंक दैट whenever there is any kind of uh, conflict between the uh, interest of humanity and the national interest of a country the national interest will prevail you know they will not think of the global peace and all after all countries are going to be guided by their national interest you know, no country can compromise with its national interest so you know that is what uh, we see rohit i think uh, uh, you lost the communication at that time and you had some uh, you are raising some very important questions please go ahead सर माय क्वेश्चन वाज मैंने ऑलरेडी बैकग्राउंड पहला क्वेश्चन ये था कि मैं आर वी ड्रिफ्टिंग फ्रॉम अ वेस्टफेलियन वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर टुवर्ड्स अ बिग टेक वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर पहला क्वेश्चन 
और दूसरा क्वेश्चन है कि डू यू थिंक चाइना इज चाइना का इतना खराब रेप्यूटेशन क्यों है गिवन कि उसने अफ्रीका में 6000 किलोमीटर का रेलवे और रोड बनाया है करीब 20 स्पोर्ट्स बनाए हैं करीब 130 हॉस्पिटल और 170 के आसपास स्कूल बनाए मतलब कि मैं रफ डेटा दे रहा हूँ एग्जैक्टली exactly मेरे पास पूरा डेटा नहीं है तो इज आई एम एफ और सॉरी आर आई एम एफ एंड वर्ल्ड बैंक नॉट वर्स लेंडर्स आर दे नॉट मोर प्रेडेटरी देन चाइना भाई मेरा कि सोवियत यूनियन and with the collapse of communism rather i will say socialism in the world you know china is the only socialist country that is surviving and that is also uh, one of the most exciting economies of the world but you see uh, you were talking about the multinational corporations china's economy if you are saying the most exciting economy of course it is with 150000 soes so it means still it owned enterprises you know china has more than 150000 state owned enterprises so one thing that china has accepted uh, the challenge of globalization since 1978 when deng came to power after mao so deng zhaoping you know started the modernization project in china created a special economic zones a special trade zones a special export zones and then went for a proper homework then you see china also joined wto you know and from there onward you'll find uh, china has been dominating in the international arena but it has been dominating with what with soes the state owned enterprises and this is state owned enterprises you know they are profit oriented enterprises the projection has been there from the capitalist ideology that uh, a country can prosper only with privatization and you know the the state control of economy should not be there rather de control should be there rather de regulation of the economy should be there why china is being targeted today because the china is becoming a roadblock in the way of universalization of capitalism because china is still controlling economy state control economy is there yes sir and because that is state controlled economy what is happening that soes of china they are dominating they are profit oriented and it shows that even if the state is controlling economy the economy can be in a very good shape as we are seeing in china the third important dimension that you have to remember that basically what has happened that there is a nexus between the you know politically governing class in most of the countries and the in uh, economically economically dominant class so what is happening that a corporatization of states corporatization of democracies is going on corporatization of democracies when i say you know i will say this corporatization of democracy why because you see that who is controlling the means of uh, controlling public opinion corporate houses we have a corporate media in our country for example so they they construct a particular kind of narrative particular kind of discourse in which you will find the real issues for example farmer society will not be an issue for example you will find mass poverty will not be an issue for example display internal displacement of the people will not be an issue uh, what the superficial emotive issues will be most of the time highlighted and that's why the corporate media becomes what is called the rather than means of communication it becomes means of mass deception isliye so sir uh, isliye sir i would uh, make chota point add karunga ki mere hisab se hum western values ko blindly incorporate kar lete hain और मैं और आई थिंक कुछ जर्नलिज्म के भी स्टूडेंट्स हैं यहाँ पे या टीचर्स हैं यहाँ पे आई थिंक फ्री इंडिपेंडेंट मीडिया इज एन ओवर रेटेड वर्च्यू आई डोंट थिंक दैट यू नो दिस फ्री इट्स इज यू नो दैट शुड बी क्वालिफाइड इज मीडिया फ्री दैट इज द फर्स्ट थिंग डू यू थिंक दैट इफ यू आर फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ यू आर जर्नलिस्ट गोइंग टू ज्वाइन अ न्यूज पेपर और टीवी चैनल are you free to you know uh, write anything according to the voice of your conscience no 
there is an you know edit, editor's uh, desk is there and he is going or she is going to edit you know what is good uh, uh, for the channel particular channel that is important for them it's mm, the tr so ultimately the voice of conscience is never heard keep in mind mm. uh, good morning sir Modern. Just uh, do you think that the uh, East Asian model uh, development ka, ki sare banks nationalized hai, or uh, there is a strong state-run enterprises or export-driven economy hai, it, or uh, there is there is a de great degree of support for national oligarchs. Malab ki, if you look at South Korea, Japan, Singapore, uh, so do you think these are the only ways of developing a nation? Because free market is not really working out that well. National oligarchs का जो आपने term use किया East Asian you know economic sense में basically you know banking sector ऐसा है basically the interest based economy you have to see that is there at the international level or within the nation तो especially bank के बारे में खास करके अगर आप देखें जो हमारे यहाँ पूरी debate ये और ये कि we are going we are embarking on the project rather we are already achieved the threshold जिसे कहते हैं denationalisation Denationalization in the name of a structural adjustment program. Uh, context mein aap dekhi. We have a lot of social uh, justice program in our country, for example, because there are historically disadvantaged communities in the country. Historically disadvantaged community segments, uh, uh, they are there. And because of that, there is an affirmative action program that uh, you know the Indian state has taken. For example, reservations uh, for certain communities because they have been uh, you know, for centuries they have been exploited and they were nowhere. So that is why they have to also reap up the fruit of development and progress of the country. So one of the ways of doing away with affirmative action programs, social justice program, reservation, etc., is to privatize and go for denationalization, go for decontrol, go for de deregulation. And you say that since there is a pressure from the global financial institutions and International Monetary Fund, World Bank, we cannot do anything, we are helpless. Uh, so by that way, you see what will happen that the dominant, uh, economically dominant class, you know, everything will be monopolized. For example, if uh, one example, because, you know, we are running short of time. Uh, uh, for example, I am teaching in a public university. The students those who are studying here, they are, you know, studying, uh, they, they are just paying around two, three thousand rupees per month and they are studying. You know, this is possible only in the universities like JNU, AMU, BHU, DU, etc. No? It is not possible in the private university where students are supposed, supposed to pay around 5 to 10 lakh for completing their graduation. Similarly, for example, if even if a student has failed or he has not scored well in the NEET examination, but if he or she is coming from a financially sound family, he can buy or purchase a seat uh, for becoming a doctor which is not possible for 90% of Indian population. So ultimately, these vital issues, because of that, you know, the denationalization program, deregulation program itself is quite misleading uh, for a country, rather dangerous, I will say, for a country like India. So that's why in that sense, I will say that, uh, you know, the mixed economy model, that is the best model. Uh, you know, where you will find that the private economy is also there, but, you know, substantial portion of the economy is controlled by the state. Because after all, you see, these days, for example, the debate freebies. Can I have freebies? Why freebies? Who, who is saying freebies? These people, you buy a BD, if someone is a student, then he gives sale tax. So what is it in free? No one is taking anything in free. The person is buying a small job, buying a small job, buying a small job, buying a small job, buying a small job. So who is taking anything in free? So ultimately, this concept is that the state is working, that you can withdraw all the things from it. और सिर्फ लाइन एंड ऑर्डर मेंटेन के जो और ये देखिए कि जो बड़े बड़े बिग कॉर्पोरेट हाउसेस हैं वो अगर डेवलप कर रहा है तो कंट्री डेवलप कर रहा है नो डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द कॉर्पोरेट हाउसेस इज डिफरेंट एंड द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द कंट्री एज अ होल इज डिफरेंट एंड दैट्स व्हाई इंक्लूसिव ग्रोथ होना चाहिए अगर इंक्लूसिव ग्रोथ नहीं होगा जिसमें ऑल सेगमेंट्स ऑफ द सोसाइटी दे आर नॉट रीपिंग ऑफ द फ्रूट ऑफ डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द कंट्री आई थिंक दैट डेवलपमेंट इज नॉट अ डेवलपमेंट एट ऑल सर मेरा एक क्वेश्चन है हेलो सर मैं नीरज राय साउथ फील्ड महाविद्यालय दार्जिलिंग से हूँ अभी जो जी ट्वेंटी में हाँ एग्जैक्ट दार्जिलिंग और कलिंग सोनादा सोनादा सर सोनादा गार्डन से 
तो अभी जो जी ट्वेंटी का कोऑर्डिनेटर है वो भी हमारे यहाँ का ही है हर्षवर्धन श्रृंगला तो यहाँ पर जी ट्वेंटी का जो प्रोग्राम किया पूरा धूम धड़ाके के साथ अभी निखिल जी ने कहा ना पूरा ताम धाम से साथ फाइव स्टार होटल में किया तो अभी यहाँ पर देखिये हमारा जो इकोनॉमिक आपने कहा इंक्लूसिव ग्रोथ का बात कह रहे हैं आप तो यहाँ पर अभी बारह से भी ज्यादा टी गार्डन बंद है नौकरी का कुछ नहीं है तो वहां पर जब वो लोग आए तो वहां पर कहा कि बड़ा बड़ा इंडस्ट्री यहाँ पर इन्वेस्टमेंट होगा क्या होगा लेकिन अभी तक कुछ नहीं हुआ है तो इसके बारे में क्या क्या कर सकता है आप टी गार्डन आप दार्जिलिंग का बोल करके यू नो रिसेंटली आवे दिन कर शौक बिकॉज माई अंकल लिव सो बदे तो मैं अपने बचपन का कर शौक दार्जिलिंग देखता हूँ और अभी देखता हूँ और मुझे बहुत अफसोस होता है जाकर के देख करके ग्रीनरी वगैरह खत्म हो गई है यू सी मैं ये समझता हूँ कि वेन द वर्ल्ड ट्रेड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन और द आई एम एफ एंड वर्ल्ड बैंक यू नो इफ दे आर कंट्रोलिंग जिसे कहते हैं ना रिमोट कंट्रोल्ड इकोनॉमी है ये दिस इज रिमोट कंट्रोल्ड इकोनॉमी दैट वी हैव टू रियलाइज एंड दैट्स वाई थर्ड वर्ल्ड तो आप नहीं कहेंगे लेकिन बहरहाल एक डेवलपिंग वर्ल्ड परस्पेक्टिव इकोनॉमिक इशूज पे डेवलप करने की कोशिश करनी चाहिए आई एम वेरी हैप्पी दैट you know the pe- people like you they are pointing out all these issues you know uh, that shows it's a v- vibrant group and i congratulate you all for yes, raising sir. very good questions and also giving very good observation and adding depth to this, the discussion that we were making so now there is paucity of time uh, i have to wind up because you know you are also having uh, a break and after that uh, some other resource mm-hmm. person will be so thank you very much Uh, I am sorry, in the sorry. Department of Political Science of Aligarh Muslim University. My name is Mohit. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, थैंक यू सर जी ट्वेंटी पे एक शेयर थैंक यू फिर कभी अब तो टाइम हो चुका है यू नो एक 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 लाइन का सर गालिब का मेरा नहीं है अच्छा चलिए बोलिए बोले पर गर्म की गालिब के उड़ेंगे पुरजे देखने हम भी गए थे पर तमाशा ना हुआ <laughs> मेरे ख्याल से तमाशा ही हुआ <laughs> चलिए फिर बहुत अच्छा इतनी सारी तमाशे भी फिर भी नहीं दिखे सर आपको मुझे बहुत अच्छी बात ये लग रही है आप आपका मुझे अच्छा ये लग रहा है कि आप स्टेक होल्डर की तरह बात कर रहे हैं ना वी आर स्टेक होल्डर इन दंट्रीज रिसोर्स एंड ऑल सर हमने दिल्ली में देखा है दिल्ली में लंबे लंबे जाम लग गया सिर्फ एक किसी डेलीगेट को आने के लिए पूरा लोक कल्याण मार्ग जाम हो गया तो ये क्या मतलब है <laughs> चलिए फिर हैव नाइस डे थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सो मच सर